All right, friends and neighbors, welcome back to another wireless networking video. This time, so you want to send a little data. Okay, so you got some data to send. Maybe somebody else has got data to send too. Maybe you're not the only one out there. Maybe the access point has something to do. The point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of stuff that's got to happen before you can send your data frame. So let's remember what we've talked about so far. First, wireless. 802.11 and in fact most wireless technologies are shared media stands to reason right no wires guiding what our transmissions are doing so everybody can hear what everybody else is doing so we got to relax we got to take turns and realize that it's shared but in addition to that on the wireless side we also have the access point that's got an awful lot to do so if we go back to our routes and we say, all right, carrier sends multiple access with collision detection in Ethernet. We're going to listen, we're going to wait, if it's clear, we'll transmit, and if there's a collision, well, we got to figure out what to do about that. On the wireless side, of course, we can't detect collisions, so we got to figure out what to do about that. All right. So in 802.11, we now know that there's two chunks of time. One is called the, the point coordinated function or the contention free, and the other one is the distributed coordinated function or the contention based time. And that's the time that we're going to talk about today. That's when nodes are actually trying to send data. Along the way, we've got to remember there are these things called interframe gaps. These are time delays that you have to wait before you can do something. And there are four different ones defined in the early 802.11 standard. Now at this point, we've joined a cell, we've done the scanning, we've done the, the uh, authentication, we've done the association, we've gotten all of the transmission data for the, the cell or the basic service set, and now we're going to transmit. Now timing is everything, and the access point maintains the timing, right? So either from the beacon or the probe response that you got from your probe request, you got timing for the cell. And the big thing that we remember is the network allocation vector. And the network allocation vector is this value that sort of describes how much time you have to transmit. And the nodes keep track of this, and anything that happens can subtract from or reset the network allocation vector. And so the nodes have to keep uh, track of this whether or not they think that the channel is free because remember that you can't transmit any time that you want. Now the duration values are what we're going to use to update the network allocation or the time that's available to a particular node but we'll talk more about that later on. Now I apologize for some of these slides in advance because they're going to be a little bit busy but bear with it and we'll get a better handle on how this all works. So we're talking about the distributed coordination function or the DCF. So the access point's done, we're done with the PCF, we're done with the contention free period and now we're going to send data. The, it is the fundamental access method or the thing that all of the nodes do. Again it's called carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. It's implemented on all of the stations. Now it doesn't matter if you're in an independent or ad hoc network or if you are using a, an access point in a basic service set. Everybody is going to do the distributed coordination function. So for, an, for a station or an STA to transmit, it's got to sense the medium and determine if another station is transmitting. So that's the listening part. If it's not busy, then you can go ahead and fire away. Otherwise, you have to do a deferral, which just means that you, you wait for a little bit. The minute the distributed coordination function time period starts, everybody is clamoring for the media. And the minute somebody's done with the transmission and the subsequent act frame has been transmitted, then everybody starts clamoring for the media again. And the more stations you have out there, the more wireless nodes, the worse it gets. So how do we manage all of these contentious nodes? I mean, right, everybody's clamoring for the media, everybody who's got something to say, so how do you manage that? Well, the one that everybody talks about is the RTS-CTS exchange. So the way that this works is that every node's got to wait for a second to see if the media is busy. And if you've waited long enough, then you can fire off a data frame. But if you're going to send a data frame, 
you might first want to make sure that the media is clear. Make sure that you're going to get your reservation in there. So you can use a little tiny RTS frame, fire that out there, and then everybody else sees that. And the receiving node, the receiving single node, right, this is not a broadcast or multicast thing, can then send back a CTS. Now everybody else in the basic server set or everybody else on that access point knows that you have now reserved the media. And the RTS frame has a duration associated with it. And you can see on the right hand side here, I guess it'd be up there, you can see uh, that there's a duration in there, in this case 2046 microseconds. And this is the amount of time that it would take to generate a data frame and then get an acknowledgement back. So everybody learns about the, uh, the reservation that a particular node has. And you can see again from the frame, they're very, very small, really nothing but a header and a couple of addresses. Now there is another way to manage all of those contentious nodes and that is with the duration. So if we're not going to use RTS-CTS, and the reason that we wouldn't want to use them is because they add overhead. Imagine you're trying to get out a data frame, and before you do that, you have to send out an RTS frame, get a CTS frame, and then you can send your data. So it's a tremendous amount of overhead, which is another reason why wireless networks can suck when they're compared to the throughput on a regular wired network. So all frames have a duration associated with them. Now there are some rules for duration, but if you don't want to use RTS-CTS, you can just use the duration values and hope that you get your frame out there and that everybody knows that the duration in that frame tells how long you have to access the media. Another part of this is that, you know, even if you're sending fragments along the way, right, you have time to do your, your fragments. That is where we broke up an MPDU. Lastly, if you want to do something sort of in between, you can say, well, I only want to do RTS-CTS for big frames. It really doesn't make much sense for little tiny frames. You know, say you got 100 bytes of data to send, and it doesn't make much sense to do a small RTS, then a CTS, then a small data field. But if you have a large amount of data, then you might want to turn on RTS-CTS. And for that, there's a threshold. I want to use RTS-CTS when my frames are above 1,000 bytes or something like that. Now with regard to duration, there are a couple of rules that we use to set up the duration value. And I've got them listed here. So if the address field 1, so remember that in a wireless frame, there are four addresses of which we use 1, 2, and 3 all the time. If address field 1 contains a group address, meaning that it's going to everybody, the duration value is set to 0. And that sort of makes sense when you think about it we're not going to be sending a lot of traffic to a multicast address or a broadcast address. So this is not for a conversation or data that's going to somebody. If the, uh, the more fragments field is set to zero, meaning that there are, this is a data frame that has not been fragmented, and the address field or the address field number one contains an individual address, meaning that you're sending this to a unicast destination, well, then there's going to be a value in the duration that's set to the microseconds required to transmit this data frame and then get uh, an act back plus one short interframe space. And the short interframe space is the time delay between the data field or the data frame and the, the corresponding act. So nodes responding to a data frame that they got wait for a SIFS to send the acknowledgement. And then, of course, we've got if this is a fragmented thing, so the fragment bits is set to 1, and address field contains an individual address or a unicast address, then we've got a similar thing. But we've got more fragments, so we need more SIFs and we need more ACKs. Okay. So the time delay that everybody has to use before they can send data is the diffs, the distributed interframe space. So the minute we're in the contention period or the distributed coordination function you've got to use the diffs meaning that you had to wait for that amount of time and that amount of time differs based on the speed of your network and the type of transmission that you're doing so whether or not you're doing frequency hopping or direct sequence or OFDM all of these values change a little bit but there's a diffs defined by your network so everybody's got to wait and the minute that expires you can go ahead and try to transmit your data 
And it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, data unit, you know, MPDU, MMPDU, right? It's, the important thing there is that we've got a data unit that may or may not be fragmented, and everybody's got to use this, this time delay to wait before they can transmit. Now, in the case where you tried to transmit and you had to defer because it was busy, or you finished and then you're ready to transmit another one, you still got to wait for the diffs or some multiple of the distributed interframe space. And the graphic uh, down below on this slide just sort of gives you an idea, right? So the source waits for the diffs to go by, might use RTS-CTS, right? And the SIFs, the short interframe space, is, is the wait time in between those. And then if the, your RTS-CTS makes it through, then you wait for another short interframe space and you can send your data. And then another short interframe space and then that can be acknowledged, but then you're back in contention and you have to wait for the diffs again. Now, if we were doing fragmentation, we would just add more data chunks for your transmission and it would be a couple more SIFs and a couple more ACKs out there as well. Well, things can always get a little bit worse. I mean, wireless networks are complicated. There's no doubt about it. So we got to mention something called hidden station. And hidden station is a condition in which nodes can see the access point but they can't see each other so the graphic on this this slide shows that right a and c can both see the access point b but they can't see each other now what's the significance here well if you were sensing the media and you were trying to hear what other wireless nodes were doing and you can't uh, hear them because you're outside of their transmission range well you might think that the media is clear and go ahead and try and fire off your transmission and this is a problem that all nodes experience. So we end up with a lot of collisions. In fact, the, sta the standard even says the time of greatest collision or the greatest probability of collision is right after the media gets free because then everybody's trying to jump on the bandwidth. So this is the point where RTS-CTS might really, really shine because the access point will get those RTS frames and send them out quickly and everybody can see what the access point is broadcasting. And so RTS-CTS is one of the ways that we combat things like hidden station. Well, wow, just wow, right? So what did we talk about in this particular video? Well, we know that the point coordination function and the distributed coordination function, the contention free and the contention periods, we flop back and forth between those. But the minute we want to send data, we've got to obey that CSMA CA set of rules. Right now everybody actually obeys that, but we're talking about nodes that want to generate data. And so we have to listen and then if it's clear we try to transmit. And the time delay that we had to listen for was the diffs. If that time expires, we know that we've got a duration allocated or a network allocation vector allocated to us to send data. But how do we get data out there? Well, we might just try to send the frames. And each frame has a duration in it that tells us how long that frame is going to take to transmit plus get acknowledged. Well, we might want to turn on RTS-CTS and some access points might have it on by default. Or we might use RTS-CTS just when there are big frames out there. But that's certainly a way to ensure that we can get our data across the network. And then lastly, we talked about hidden station, which is where the nodes can see the access point but not each other. And RTS-CTS can help us with that too. So that was a lot. Hopefully you followed along okay. Hopefully I helped you with your understanding of how data transmission in a wireless network works. Next up, we'll do an iPerf comparison between wired and wireless nodes to see how this really sort of plays out in a real world. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Like and subscribe if I helped, and may those wireless packets always reach their destinations. No matter what your network allocation vector, hidden station, or contention problems might be.